I'm Melody Birkins, Associate Director at the John Sloan Dickey Center, and just wanted to welcome all of you here. Um, this is this talk. I've uh, been very excited to get Dr. Marga Gualsalar or Marga here for a very long time. In part, this is why I came back to Dartmouth, and this position at the Dickey Center was to marry my lifelong interests in advancing science and marrying it to diplomacy. And some of the founders of that. Um, happened to be in Washington, D.C., who I'd met through, often through Twitter, and then a few other conversations. But Margaret, I think, met through Twitter in about 2015 or so, and actually looking through our thread. Um, and we've gotten so close that I was telling her about my son's food poisoning this weekend on Twitter <laughs> over those last three years. We have met in person a few other times, but it is such an honor to have her here. And what that, she'll tell you about Twitter. These are the, this is a science, putting science and diplomacy together. Um, as she's talked about with many students she's met with today, they don't always go together. And you have to find spaces where there are like-minded people who think these should go together and they, they, they are valuable together and they support one another and make them each greater. And to do that, Twitter, has a hashtag, science diplomacy, which when you start going there, you find these other people who think it's really cool too. Um, and it's very hard to find that in other spaces. You find science and you find diplomacy. So this was why we started, to, and the network has grown. I joke that it's 40 of us, hopefully a little more than that. Um, we use the hashtag, and we're trying to kind of build this idea. And in fact, part of why I have Marga here is that I would like to put in a grant to help Dartmouth do even more around uh, putting science and diplomacy together. And I won't say more about why, because I'm going to leave that to Margaret to tell you, because she goes all over the world and talks about this. She's a science diplomat herself, as well as a science diplomacy advocate, and uh, advocate, practitioner, and evangelist, I'd say. We're, that's what we are. So to let you know who she is, she's known as one of the world's experts in science diplomacy. She is the senior project director at the the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Again, I won't go into that. This is one of this is the home of the idea of science diplomacy, and has been a pioneer in expanding the idea of science diplomacy's theoretical, practical, and educational approaches to ev everywhere she 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 works. Um, she leads global science diplomacy research, education, and capacity building at the Center for Science and Diplomacy in DC, manages the Latin American portfolio, including the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and Cuba Science Diplomacy Program. And she serves as the associate editor of a policy journal called Science and Diplomacy. And you can find that online for free. It's fascinating articles by scientists and by diplomats, and, and in Marga's hand. Um, for the past 10 years, <laughs> what's that? Only three. Oh, only three. <laughs> first come, first served. Um, for the past 10 years, Dr. Gwalsalar has worked in over 40 countries in all continents, including Antarctica just recently, building bridges across the science policy diplomacy nexus and often in diplomatically challenging environments. In fact, that's one of the places science diplomacy has been deployed in incredible, incredibly impactful ways. She's established multi-stakeholder partnerships in governments in, with governments in Argentina, Chile, Mexico, and Spain, with international organizations such as UNESCO, the World Academy of Sciences, the Inter-American Institute of Global Change Research. And she has built a science diplomacy networks with over 20 universities and colleges worldwide. <laughs> she has published dozens of academic policy and media works. She serves as a high-level policy advisor on the Research, Innovation, and Science Experts Group, I guess RISE, um, to the European Commissioner, Carla, Carlos Mortis, and on the advisory board of the Horizon 2020 project. And some of you know Horizon 2020, it's international research through the EU, um, a project called Inventing a Shared Science Diplomacy for Europe. She helped design the first science, technology, and innovation diplomacy strategy for the Spanish government and was named in many places, one of the 100, Sp 100 Spanish experts in innovation by Fundacion Cotec, it's almost 40 under 40 Latinos in foreign policy by the Huffington Post, as well as 10 Latinos thinking think big innovators to watch in 2016. So she's out there at the forefront of these ideas. She received her PhD in biomedical sciences from the University of Queensland in Australia uh, and her master's from the University of Barcelona. And she's an alumna of the Georgetown Global Competitiveness Leadership Program. We're really honored to have her, and I get to use her brain for the next day or so, which is wonderful. Please welcome Dr. Salah. Well, thank, thank you, Melody, for this really long intro. Um, sometimes I forget everything I've done, so it's great that someone reminds you. 
Um, I'm so glad to be here. I've been here since last night and today. I had the chance to, to speak with many of you and, and it's good to see some faces that I've already uh, met this morning and, and lunch, uh, lunch. And it's really, really wonderful to finally be here in person because as Melody was saying, we um, talked on Twitter and then we uh, established some conspiracies. We, we met uh, at different places. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but really I was very intrigued to, to, to get to know uh, Dartmouth and especially the, the Dickey Center because it's a very unique place, a very unique uh, institution that uh, I think is a model for other uh, um, universities and, 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 and countries. So I really, I'm really inspired by everything I've learned so far about you and I look forward to discussing how we can take this further and hopefully getting some money from funders will help. Um, so I, I thought I would start um, with just a little bit of a science diplomacy 101 because um, you know, I wasn't sure how many of you were familiar with this concept, so uh, I will speak a little bit about that and then we'll go a little more in depth into the education and training aspects which uh, I think are most relevant for us um, and, and for our collaboration moving forward. So I am a scientist by training. I, I am a molecular cell biologist. I spent 10 years doing research in the lab in, you know, in a very narrow field. And during that training, I never thought, I never even you know, conceived the idea of science being remotely connected or, or related to uh, diplomacy. Actually, I thought these two concepts were opposite and were at odds. And, and you know, some of this thinking is informed by some quotes, famous quotes uh, from very famous um, individuals that you might recognize. And, 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 and I think this uh, perception of science um, and the perception of diplomacy being two separate worlds with you know, their own culture, their own goals, and their own norms, uh, it really has uh, kept us apart for a long time without realizing that, in fact, science and diplomacy need each other. And, and, and I will talk about how this is more evident than ever in, now in the, in, the, in the 21st century. So um, in summary, I'd like to, to show this chart because I think it's really, it really uh, uh, captures um, these two worlds, these two cultures, these two um, universes that um, when you study science, you never come in contact with diplomacy or political science or international relations or law. And when you study diplomacy or you go into the foreign service, in many countries, I would say most countries, you don't get a scientific, uh, even a basic scientific uh, exposure. Um, so the Canadian diplomat, Dario Copeland, wrote this book called Guerrilla Diplomacy. And um, he, you know, if you're interested in sort of the uh, description of the two worlds and then how they merge, I, I, I highly recommend it. But basically, uh, scientists are um, risk takers, as you know. They are transparent. They work by collaborating, and they need the, f the best. Uh, they need to find the best resources and ideas, no matter where in the world they come from. So they will talk to anyone. Scientists from Spain will talk to a scientist in South Africa. Because you know, if they have a, a chemistry question, they won't care. They won't mind uh, where are they coming from, to in order to work together to resolve that uh, question. Um, however, dipl diplomacy and diplomats are very different in the sense that um, it is the opposite of risk taking. It is about uh, balance and equilibrium and 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 preserving uh, the conditions. And there is not much of experimentation because you can't afford it. Also, the, the time frames of things, right? Scientists can work on a project for 10 years. And, and you do a PhD, it takes you six years. And then you publish a paper. It's years in the making. And in the world of uh, diplomacy and international affairs, decisions and information need to come in minutes or hours. And you cannot afford to take your time to research all the facts and make sure your decision is the best possible. Sometimes you just have to work with what you have. So, um, you know, science being evidence-based and diplomacy not being always evidence-based, it's, 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 it's also a question. So how 
do we bring together these very two different worlds? Um, and, and to answer that question, we, we look back because one of, so we tend to think science diplomacy is a new um, concept, but it's not. It's a new label to a very old practice. And, 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 and I think we have to be very careful to not say this is the new buzzword as in a new trend, with, and, which is sometimes dangerous with things like entrepreneurship that became, or innovation that become buzzwords and then they mean nothing. Um, science diplomacy is a very old practice that was just not labeled as such. And, and um, there are some wonderful examples of how science has influenced international relations since uh, the old ages and, and trade and everything that, world, that brought us the, uh, the modern world. And also how science and knowledge were always bridges um, in, you know, between cultures and civilizations, even in times of conflict, um, even in, in ancient times, there was always a protection for knowledge and a protection for scholars. Uh, trying to, to, to isolate them a little bit from the uh, turbulence of, of, of politics and, and conflict and, and, and so forth. Um, in the scientific, I would say the scientific societies and academies of science are one of the oldest uh, practitioners of science diplomacy because they, are, they, they were established um, in, the, in, the, in the age of the Enlightenment and often uh, an academy of science would have a person who would represent the, this uh, scientific community abroad. And this person would be called a uh, foreign secretary that would go around the world collecting and, and, and getting uh, to know what was going on in other parts of the world. That, you know, talking about hundreds of years ago, it would take years to go around the world and, and, and see what the rest was doing. Now it takes seconds because you just go on the internet so you can communicate instantly. But before, so the whole idea of, of building scientific communities uh, was based on gathering and, 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 and becoming aware of what research was uh, happening around the world and connecting it. So this idea of foreign secretary of, a, of an academy of science, in the case of the, of the, of the UK, for instance, it's interesting because it, 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 it preceded the actual position of a foreign minister. So when we think about diplomacy, the representative of, a, of, the, of the diplomatic corp in a, in a given country is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, but in the case of uh, the Royal Society, which is the, the, the scientific, uh, the Academy of Sciences in the, in the UK, there was a position for a foreign correspondent, a foreign secretary for science, than the actual government had a position of foreign secretary or foreign minister uh, in the government. So these are very, very old um, positions, very old descriptions of how science uh, diplomats uh, started. And in, in this part of the, the Atlantic, uh, you also have plenty of examples of, of um, very, again, very famous statemen who were not just politicians or not just um, foreign secretaries, but also scientists and inventors. And here we see, like in the in the the example of Ben Franklin, how science uh, gives you sometimes prestige and elevates you above or gives you advantages over other um, sectors. And you can use the, that prestige to influence, to attract, to convince, and that is how you use what we call, and we'll talk about this a little later, the soft power of science. So science can be used to attract and to convince and to persuade um, in, 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 in different ways to get what you want. And, and so using science can overcome sometimes obstacles um, of achieving objectives by other means, like political or, or economic. Um, but I don't, I'm not gonna lecture you in American history um, being a Spanish person. Um, but in the 20th century, I think there are a few examples to highlight because that's when science diplomacy really, really takes off. And, and uh, first part, um, or the, the greatest part of last century um, was of course marked by conflict and war. And after that, in, in, in the 50s, uh, nations realized that they have to come together and, and, and and you know, govern the world in a different way because that other, the older model wasn't working. 
So um, science is used in many of the examples you see in this slide as the first icebreaker when countries come out of conflict. So when you have a long period of diplomatic strain, countries have not been friendly to each other, and then they decide to, to um, make amends and come back to the relationship, it is really hard to start. Where do we start? What do we do together? The first thing is very easy as the first thing to agree to do, to do science together, because no one really can challenge that science is important. Science is kind of a neutral thing. It's much less delicate or, or, or contentious than issues of human rights or others that are really more sensitive. So you can, you can agree to do science together, even if you've had a lot of differences and troubles before. So the first agreements that are signed, uh, bilateral agreements, um, as you see in, in, in the case of Japan and China, uh, many of those agreements are science agreements. And that is how we, 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 we refer to science as an icebreaker when countries come back from um, conflict. And, and also, the, um, we were talking this morning about the example of space diplomacy, space science diplomacy uh, during the Cold War. So as you know, throughout the Cold War, even at the height of the tensions between the US and the Soviet Union, the cooperation uh, in space was always um, sustained and, and, and valued by both as important. And uh, the famous um, handshake in space, which is a very famous picture that shows the, the, the Soviet and the, and the American astronauts shaking hands in space, it was really symbolic because those, that handshake could not happen on Earth, but was happening on space, in space for, for, for the sake of science and continuing this uh, partnership and the, the space exploration above Earth. Um, the other example I want to highlight of how science has had this role of bringing uh, adversaries together is uh, the creation of CERN. Um, CERN is this big accelerator particle physics lab in Geneva. Actually, it's between Geneva and France under, under, underground. And that the first idea of building this mega science infrastructure came from UNESCO, which had the mandate of uh, building science for peace. And, and, and CERN was, was, was designed to bring together the East and the West, uh, former European adversaries after World War II. And so it's, it's a way to reconstruct trust between the former antagonist uh, and to uh, find a scientific problem to solve together. Um, and, 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 and then scientists day by day collaborating next to each other from all these different countries uh, help uh, rebuild the relationship and, and, and rebuild the trust. Um, and a very similar model is now being, um, is this working? Yes. A very similar model is being now uh, kind of replicated in the Middle East, and, and it's called Sesame. And it's a, a, a synchrotron. Uh, it's less powerful than, than CERN, but um, it really serves the purpose of bringing 10 uh, countries in the Middle East that, as you can see, who they are in the, in the red um, boxes, most of them are at war with each other. And um, they, despite that very challenging political situation, they all agree to come together and fund and support this uh, scientific infrastructure. And each country sends a representative that is a science, scientist, so a, a, a physicist, or the best person to represent the scientific community in that country, and then a diplomat. So in the, the Sesame Council, each, each member state has two seats, a scientist and a diplomat. So that really forces countries to, to, to get the, literally the scientists and diplomats together because they cannot be part of this partnership without the two. Uh, and, and of course, the hope is that over time, this facility and this place will be a, 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 a place of rebuilding relationships and trust and, and hopefully education, scientific training will, will help slowly rebuild the trust and, and, and change um, mindsets. Um, so when we arrived to the 21st century, all of these needs of scientists and diplomats coming together are exacerbated. So it's no longer a nice thing to do. Now it is 
imperative. Because the way I put it, we have three characteristics of any challenge that, that we can name, right? The first is that everything has a scientific or, te or technological dimension. So think about food security or water or energy, climate. And science has a role either helping understand what's going on or finding the solutions. So for instance, in, 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 and sometimes both, and more, most, more often than not both. So for understanding climate change, we need climate science, we need to understand what's going on. But then we need new technology, uh, green technology, renewable energy, and, and, and that comes from technology and innovation. And we need um, to have both um, dimensions um, together. The second uh, trait of our challenges today is that almost everything is transboundary, right? Every threat, um, because we are, are more mobile than ever, and we move people and goods and trade, and everything moves so fast that uh, you know if something happens here, and and you get you know you 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 cough in 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 a little town north of here. Tomorrow, there can be a, you know, a pandemic in Tokyo. So that is really the, 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 the consequence of our globally connected world and, and, and globalization. Um, and then the, 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 the question of who owns what. So if you have a, an ecosystem that's shared between two countries, but the wildlife moves freely because the wildlife doesn't know when your country finish, finishes and my country starts. So we are sharing natural resources and, and we are sharing ecosystems and biodiversity that, that, that are not bound by those artificial imaginary lines that we call national borders. So, and of course, this is even more um, obvious when we talk about oceans and, and marine resources. So um, we have, of course, international law that tells us, okay, here's your piece of ocean and here's my piece of ocean and you cannot come, you know, cannot fish in my, in, my, in my part, but even this is a very, very complex system where things are moving constantly, so you need the scientists and the diplomats, the lawmakers, and whoever decides what belongs to who to work together to understand and make the best possible policies and, 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 and delimitations um, to, to it. And then, you know, the, the extreme example is climate change because you don't even, the, 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 the source of the problem um, the location where the problem originates is not the same as the, 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 the part of the world that will receive the consequences more harshly. So you have this really global problem that is climate change or you know, the, the ozone uh, hole, which is now healing because of science diplomacy, and I will talk about it. But um, it is really now a global um, global threat, global opportunity kind of world. And um, then there's the parts of the world that don't belong to anyone, and they have to be managed by coming together and deciding on agreements and, and rules to manage those uh, territories that are not um, sovereign, um, within sovereign nations. And actually, 70%, we'll see that later, 70% of the Earth is not within a sovereign country, which is very shocking when you think about it. We think, oh, most of it belongs to someone. No, 70%. We only control 30% within our borders. Um, two types of threats that are extremely important to, for science diplomacy, infectious disease. So anything, global health diplomacy, very important because now you get very fast disease spreading. And we saw that with the Ebola case, how quickly uh, any pandemic can spread and how science and the rest of the ecosystem of uh, emergency response and WHO and the CDC and, and ministries of health, everybody had to come together like ASAP. So science diplomacy in emergencies or science advice in emergency is critical. So it's not all this long-term, you know, let's, let's think about the Arctic in 50 years, right? Could be, it could be an argument, oh, these things are very slow, you know, you have this suit of things that are you know, immediate and they can affect us all tomorrow. Also natural disasters, right? We get a hurricane uh, from the Caribbean and it's, there, it's here tomorrow and if we're not 
well con um, connected and, and in sync with every country that the, the path of the hurricane is going through, uh, we are much more vulnerable. And I'm going to talk about that with the case of Cuba. And then my last, I think, pitch for science diplomacy is that we really can't solve any of those issues alone, and alone meaning by one country alone, one sector alone, or one discipline alone. So we can't have diplomacy ignoring the science because there is no way that the, the diplomats can get the knowledge that they need to, to resolve this and, 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 and vice versa. So um, as I was saying, the concept, the practice of science diplomacy is old, but the concept is new. So in 2010, AAAS, so the Center for Science Diplomacy, and the Royal Society that I mentioned in London came together and decided to give this a little bit of a framework because it was a practitioner-driven um, field. It was more of an anecdotal, oh, well, I don't know, I was sitting next to ambassador so-and-so, and I happened to talk to him, and it was all like, you know, about that. Um, and, 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 and we needed a more structured framework for science diplomacy, some definitions, and, and especially frameworks are needed in order to research and teach something. And if we want to teach science diplomacy to the next generation, uh, it can't be just, just this anecdotal you know, evidence of how a scientist happened to be sitting next to an ambassador on a plane. Because now you need to, to, to do this by design, right? Not by serendipity. So um, we gave science diplomacy a definition and um, some pillars and frameworks that I will, I will summarize um, soon, um, and, and all of this happened, as I was saying, the, the Center for Science Diplomacy in Washington and the Royal Society in London coming together to develop this uh, framework. Our center, um, as Melody was saying, we have our, our biggest, our sort of most um, well-known um, feature is our journal. So we publish the only science diplomacy journal that exists so far, because we are trying to collect all of these case studies and examples and, and analysis um, of science diplomacy and how it's evolving, because it's been evolving very, very fast in these seven years, eight years or so. Um, so I encourage you to, to look at the, at the journal. It's free, open access, and it has any, all, all topics from nuclear to global health to um, oceans, uh, any, any scientific topic that you can imagine has a science diplomacy connection. And, and, and we have, uh, we've been really fortunate to get all of those stories and cases submitted to us so we can really start building the intellectual foundation for science diplomacy. And also we have a lot of, uh, and I'll talk about that, a lot of examples of countries saying, oh, here's my approach to science diplomacy. And I created this position in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or I trained my diplomats and so and so. So it is really also useful to collect how countries are approaching it so then those can be models for other countries uh, wanting to, to strengthen uh, their science diplomacy capacity. Um, so we, we publish this journal, which is our main feature, but also we do training and capacity building that I'll go in with um, following Melody's um, promise that we're gonna look after some funding together. Um, and also we do relationship building, meaning that we try to bring together scientists from the US and countries that don't have good diplomatic relations officially. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then we build community, meaning that we have conferences and events and we try to bring together as much as possible um, the scientists and the diplomats. The problem is that we do this, when we do this in person, it's usually in Washington, so that means um, we cannot always reach all of you all the time, right? But uh, we're working on it, on, on, on expanding. So when this definition and or framework uh, for science diplomacy was established, it was very simple. It's a three-pillar definition. It's, as I was saying, it's evolved over time already, but the idea was that there are three ways you can approach science diplomacy. First, you can take the diplomatic community and you can use that diplomatic structure to advance science. So if you need to do what we call big science, like particle physics or uh, you know, astronomy, anything that is very expensive and that requires you know, large instruments, very expensive in a, in a particular place in the world, those instruments are not and it doesn't make sense for every country to have 
their own telescope. First, because not every country has the conditions, the optimal conditions for that, uh, but also because it wouldn't make sense because it, it is much cheaper and efficient to pull resources and say, okay, 20 countries are going to fund this one facility and it happens to be maybe in Chile because Chile has these conditions, but it also it could be Hawaii or it could be um, the Canary Islands in Spain. But once the scientists decide that there is a scientific reason to build certain infrastructure in, in a certain country or a place, then the diplomatic community has to make it happen because scientists are not the ones negotiating um, you know, how much money each country is going to put in, how much time do, do we each get to, to observe in, in the telescope, uh, what happens if you don't pay, uh, how, can you be kicked out, or you know, what, what are the, the, the rules, and those rules are usually uh, set up in the form of diplomatic treaties and agreements. So most of these um, instruments are not just scientific instruments, they are diplomatic treaties. And, and that is something that not everybody understands or, or, or realizes, right? It's not just you show up and you say, oh, can I you know, do my science here? No, you need to be part of a member state and you need to request time and you need to you know, have a process. And that process is, is, is managed very closely by diplomats. So that is a case in which the scientists and diplomats of a country need to work very closely um, because Again, there is no, it doesn't make sense that each country has a space station, although some countries are trying to get their own right, things in space. But in principle, it would be much more efficient if we have one facility that is managed by all of us, and then we take turns in, 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 in managing it and using it, and then share the, the, the results in an you know, open and transparent way. Of course, that is not always the case. Um, the second dimension of science diplomacy, I think, is the most familiar because it's really what it, the equivalent of uh, evidence-based policy or evidence-informed uh, policy, but instead of being just providing scientific evidence to a domestic um, context, it's to an international or a multilateral setting. Um, so as I was saying before, after World War II, um, countries realized that there were, uh, you know, there was a need to really come together and say, all these spaces that we share, we should formally come together and, and, find, and figure out a way to manage them uh, in, a, in a peaceful and, 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 and um, reasonable way. Um, so with the creation of the United Nations, uh, so the UN was um, the host of many of those initial conversations, and many of the agreements and treaties came out of the UN. So the UN started to put together those different uh, programs um, and, and, and bringing together the key players to decide, okay, we need to have a high seas treaty. So we're gonna manage the high seas, you know, in the areas that are outside of everybody's jurisdiction or uh, the deep seas for the same, for the same reason um, or outer space, right? So space is a common, it's a global common. No one owns it, but we need to have rules. So this, uh, I have a little bit of a, a, a cheat sheet here, like a, a definition. I don't like to give many definitions because it gets really boring. But it, 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 sometimes it can get confused. What is it a global common? What is it a, um, a, a shared space? And what's a transboundary resource? And I, I alluded to some of it, uh, but uh, there, there is a strict definition for what is a global common, and this is a, a, a piece of earth that no one owns formally and officially and meaning there is no uh, indigenous peoples that were there even in the past, so no one has ever been there, um, in, meaning humans. Um, and that in the high seas, outer space, the atmosphere, so the air, no one owns the air. Um, and Antarctica, and Antarctica is a special case that I will just um, allude to, but one of the things that now this definition is evolving is that we have global commons that maybe are man-made as well because the internet so we're, we're discussing who owns the internet. Is the internet should be a global common? Is, you know, do we have to declare it as, you know, as necessary as air? <laughs> because you know, some people might argue that it is a global common and no one should control it. And then we have issues like net neutrality and who's allowed to, to control what you, you, know, what you see. So 
it is really evolving from the natural, the definitions we've worked with in the past of natural resources and things that are just naturally occurring to things that are man-made that we've created. And then, uh, of course, the question of nuclear weapons, because, of course, we're trying to to go towards a, a global agreement that 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 you know we collectively uh, decide what to do with our nuclear arsenal and not each country um, uh, having full control and only over their 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 nuclear weapons. Um, so then the second definition is the shared spaces. So when we have um, areas that fall under two jurisdictions, so we can think of rivers and lakes and and you know things that are shared by two or more countries, but there is not a clear line. So there needs to be an agreement, uh, and usually they come in form of diplomatic treaties, for especially for rivers, because you know you could you could say, oh, I'm going to build a dam in my part of the river, and this is my territory, and this is me, and I could just do whatever I want with my part of the river. But then that cuts the the water to downstream to the next country, and then th that country has the right to water. So then they go and, 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 and bring that uh, to, the, to the international courts, of course. So to avoid that, most multi-country rivers are now uh, part of uh, diplomatic treaties. And you need scientists tell, you know, doing all your calculations and how much water each country gets and when, and if you can build a dam, and how much are you allowed to keep and release. So all of that is a scientific problem. But then it is also a political decision, and you know it really it has to do with power and who is the most powerful in the game and who's the less powerful and and how and what are the dynamics so especially the regional dynamics and you, you can think of examples like uh, the Nile in in Africa there are many um, there are many rivers that are sources of the biggest conflicts in the world and those are conflicts over water and they need both the scientific and the diplomatic um, elements together. Um, and then the last definition is on transboundary resources. So I mentioned that. So when you have you know, a population of sharks circling in the Caribbean between the US and Cuba, are the sharks American or Cuban? That, it doesn't make sense to ask that question. But then when we have fisheries and when we have uh, uh, commercial interests, we need to decide how much each is allowed to get and how long it takes to replenish, blah, blah, blah. So then, we get also treaties that, that deal with that and, 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 and monitor and control what uh, each of the countries can do um, to it. And, and again, you need the science to understand what's going on in the ecosystem, but then you need a diplomatic agreement or a treaty to control and, and share um, that. And I, was, um, I have a few um, logos here of the, I think, some of the most important, some for good news, some for bad news. The Antarctic Treaty is, is considered as the gold standard of science diplomacy, and it's a very hopeful um, success story, if you will, because that it, it, it meant that in, in 1959, countries looked at that mass uh, continent, and they said, you know, instead of, as usual, fighting over who gets what and going to war and, 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 and using it for nuclear testing or whatever, Let's use that continent for science only. And so Antarctica was declared as a continent governed by science for peaceful pur purposes. And if you think about it, for 1950, it's, it's a pretty advanced thinking. And, 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 and uh, you know, I think the most, uh, I would say, impressive thing is that it hasn't been broken yet. So it really endures. Uh, we'll see when it's up for revision what happens and who, you know, which countries come and, and, and and, and, and bring out their claims. And that, that is not to say that there are no territorial claims on Antarctica, because there are. So countries are going to still try to get a piece of it. But those claims were left aside, and they, they, the countries decided we are not going to bring those claims into the treaty. So any conversation on, on territorial claims is out of this treaty. We are not. We're just going to pretend we don't have those claims. And that is a little naive, but it, it has worked. Um, and then. Um, the, the lesson, I think, so, so the, the, the greatest and the biggest and most ambitious climate science diplomacy agreement uh, that we've had recently was the Paris Agreement. Of course, um, it, took, it took a long time and a lot of effort, and now it's in jeopardy. Um, and I think it's, it's important to point that science diplomacy is always very, very fragile. And, 
you know, you can have a huge success and the world was celebrating the Paris Agreement and we couldn't believe that 200 countries came together and signed it. And then, you know, the next day or the next year, you get a, a president that says, oh, I'm just gonna, I, I don't like it, I'm, I'm gonna get out. So um, it is really a, a, a constant, um, you know, work in progress and you can never take anything for granted. Um, but I will say about that, sort of the high note of the Paris Agreement is that it prompted a, a wave of sub-national science diplomacy that we hadn't seen before. So now, science, so science diplomacy has not, uh, is not the exclusive domain of nation states, it's not the exclusive domain of a federal government, although of course that is the most powerful way to do it. But if your federal government, like in the US, withdraws from the Paris Agreement, that doesn't mean you cannot meet those targets because if you get together all your governors and you get together all your mayors and you get together California, New York and so forth and, and they all uh, pledge to, and like, like they have done, they pledge to, to not only meet but exceed those uh, commitments, maybe it will not be the same, but you can have, you can make, you can still make progress, uh, you know, during the period that your federal conditions are not favorable to this to this, um, to this pact. And um, I just want to bring up, because I know you are working on it, uh, as, as I understand uh, from, from many of you, that you're working on the SDGs, and I think this is one of the greatest uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, the, the latest example of, of science diplomacy. And if you notice, science is not a goal, it's not a science and technology goal but it's, it's really embedded in each of those 17 goals. And you need science for everything here. Um, some people argue that having science not be not explicit is maybe uh, a problem because it, it won't um, sort of, uh, it's not explicit that science should be promoted and more, you know, research, in, promoting research investments. Uh, but really the, the, the important thing is to recognize that science uh, underlies all of the sustainable development goals and the agenda 2030. And finally, the last um, dimension of science diplomacy is the original. Um, science diplomacy in the beginning was associated with conflict, how science can help in times of political strain and, and how can help overcome or open challenge, channels of communication when um, the diplomatic and the political ch uh, channels are not available. Um, so we have a number of examples. Um, recently, um, again, another one that maybe is not moving forward as we expected, but um, for, for a few years now, since 2015, um, we achieved um, a deal, the US, Iran, and, uh, and um, a group of European nations uh, a deal with Iran, a nuclear deal that was very, very hard. Uh, it was attempted many, 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 many times and there were many negotiations that didn't really work. And this time what was different was that the, negotiate, the, the two negotiating teams had uh, scientists uh, really not just advising or, or sort of at the back, they had scientists sitting on the table and negotiating on their own right and those scientists were um, the heads of the, the, the two energy and atomic agencies in, in the US and Iran. So, so um, Secretary Moniz in the US and, and Professor Salehi in Iran. Th th those two were not just uh, scientists, they were both physicists that studied together at MIT. So the, the bond that, that brought them together was uh, physics and they uh, appeared in this headline saying, we both spoke physics and the New York Times it was the first time I saw the New York Times, you know, explicitly having a science diplomacy headline. And it's, it's really the language and the common, uh, you know, language of physics that allowed them to set aside, not, not, not diminishing, not discounting that there were other very important issues to, to discuss and to resolve. It's not a substitute like, oh, we just, the scientists are talking and then everything is, 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 is done and it's solved. No, but science can really help break that ice and, and bring people together because they share their, you know, alma mater, their institution, 
and their their you know willingness to 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 um, to solve this problem diplomatically and not by other means. Um, so in that case, we kind of go back to the original definition of science as a, the science diplomacy using science as the universal language, when other uh, uh, channels for uh, communication are stalled or they're under strain and, and, and trust has been lost, how can we go back? And one of the, uh, I think, cool examples that, again, doesn't guarantee that you will succeed in any other sphere because, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give you an example of North Korea, of science diplomacy between the US and North Korea that didn't translate in any, you know, political um, success or, or improvement. Um, and, and that is one of the lessons of science diplomacy that is a very slow process and you cannot expect results overnight, um, is that we, um, we worked with a team of um, seismologists on a volcano that, is, that sits in the border between North Korea and China. And this is a volcano that was never studied by Western scientists. So the characteristics of, the, of this volcano were not published in international journals. So if you wanted to know anything about this volcano or you were concerned, oh, when is it going to erupt? Is there any data that, that can you know, tell me? You could not find that information. So the North Korean government decided that it was a sufficient enough reason uh, to, to understand this volcano because it was, it was the lack of scientific understanding was detrimental for them and for everyone else in the region, uh, you know, should the volcano erupt. Um, and, and they allowed uh, Western scientists for the first time in North Korea to study this volcano. And this is a project that we funded, um, and, but did, we didn't send American scientists because the US has the strongest sanctions against North Korea. We chose the British scientists because the UK has also sanctions, but they are less um, strict. So there's some equipment that if you are American, you cannot bring into North Korea, but if you are British, you can. And there are all these rules about what you can bring for how long, and then you need to retrieve it because you can't leave it there because it could be dual use and they could make you know, different things with them. Uh, and and, and the, the bottom line is that Sometimes when you have a bilateral relationship that's not working, you can use other countries, you can, or you can have a multilateral approach to, to find a partner that is more welcome. In that case, the British, the Brits were more, uh, you know, had easier access to, the, to North Korea, and, to, and these are North Korean scientists uh, working with the British scientists, and the result was a paper that was published in Science Advance. And, and that is a very important lesson for science diplomacy. Science, the science has to be real and excellent. You cannot just pretend to do a research project for you know, ulterior motives, because the scientists themselves will feel that they are being used as instruments for, you know, for political reasons. And here you have scientists that generally, they really wanted to study this volcano. They, they, it was absolutely legit uh, you know, purpose and motivation uh, they didn't want to solve you know, the US-North Korea issue. They wanted to study the volcano. Uh, and the, the, the proof of that is that they get a research paper that is peer-reviewed internationally. And that is what tells you that the science is legit and the science is real and you're not trying to set up projects just to, 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 you know, as a cover for something else. And we have, we've seen examples of people jumping into science diplomacy I would say too soon when you know, sort of it became this buzzword or this trend. And then um, there is an example in, um, in Cyprus uh, that, um, as you know, it's a, an island that is um, also divided. And the, um, you know, there was a proposal to, oh, let's do research on a, you know, shared forest to improve relationships between the two groups. And if you write that in a proposal, you know, the government will be like, what, what are you doing? Are you, are you trying to use science for political reasons? No, that doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. If there is not a scientific question that drives that um, interaction between the two sides, it will not work and you'll get backlash and then uh, you will not be taken seriously ever again. And so that brings me to my last example, which is Cuba. So Cuba is one of our biggest um, uh, areas of work. Um, we have been working with Cuba since 1997. As you know, 
Cuba and the U.S. had no diplomatic relations for 50 years since the Cuban Revolution, and it was really hard for U.S. and Cuban scientists to work together. In Cuba, there was no internet. Um, Cubans could not easily travel, and Americans also have an embargo uh, that prevents um, them to, uh, from traveling to Cuba for tourism and, and laser purpose. There are some except, except, exceptions for humanitarian and educational reasons, and that is the, 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 the opening that we use to, to, to do our work. So um, it is very easy to justify, I think, that Cuba and the US need to have scientific engagement. I was talking about infectious disease. So all the tropical um, disease like Zika or Dengue or Chikungunya that are in the Caribbean, because of climate change, all of these diseases are coming up to our latitude faster and faster. So it's a, a national security reason, if you will, to say we need to collaborate with the countries where those issues originate so we can stop them from coming to us. So it's a very logical, I think, reason to, to engage with, with a country like Cuba and, and, and the Caribbean in general. And also, uh, of course, the natural disasters. And, 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 and I'll show you a very nice headline that shows that we really, uh, it is detrimental for everyone that our meteorological agencies don't talk to each other. So if these are government agencies, they're not allowed to communicate, but it is, it is really crucial for you know, constant communication and monitoring between meteorological meteorological agencies um, in the region to be uh, better prepared for when these hurricanes or other disasters um, arrive. So we have been working with Cuba very quietly. Um, and in and, and the beginning, it was really hard taking, you know, a two-day trip took two years of planning. And that's what put a lot of people off. You know, you're like, well, I'm, not, I'm just not going to try because it's too hard. But there are ways to go to, to these countries. There are ways that you can apply for licenses to the Department of Treasury, which is the holder of the sanctions. And you can uh, say, well, I need, you know, you write very, very justi justify a long proposal saying, I really need to do this work in Cuba. Please let me go. And then they authorize you to go. But there are no flights to Cuba. There were no flights, uh, commercial flights. So you have to go on a charter. And it all is, is really, for 90 miles, of, of, of a trip, it's, it's, it was really, really a nightmare, a logistical nightmare. Um, but we thought we would do it because it was really to show, to demonstrate the power of science diplomacy and how uh, an organization that is non-governmental, like AAAS, um, is able to broker those relationships. So we are non-governmental, we are non-profit, and we are not subject to the same um, sanctions and restrictions than, for example, the NIH, which is a government funded research um, entities. So if NIH scientists want to go to Cuba, they can't because you cannot use, because of this embargo, you cannot use federal money for, to benefit what they call, they, to benefit Cuban people. Um, so learning about all of these details and intricacies of embargoes and sanctions and the economic um, um, instruments, um, it is really, really, I think, um, it, it, it it makes you realize how we take for granted science collaboration around the world. We take for granted that we can work with anyone from anywhere and we can just buy a ticket and show up in our collaborator's lab. We can buy a ticket and get to any conference around the world. And we used to take for granted all of that. Um, and again, recently this has been um, challenged and even started to, 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 to reverse uh, with, for instance, travel bans so people from certain countries cannot come to the US. So that means they cannot come to scientific conferences. And that really impedes the free flow and free, uh, yeah, the free flow of knowledge and, 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 and scientific information, which is the basis of, of science. Um, so under these conditions of absolutely no diplomatic relationship, we managed to get to the point of signing an MOU, which was the first uh, you know, agreement signed by anyone any U.S. institution with Cuba, um, and, and scientific institution, and we signed an agreement with the Cuban Academy of Sciences that would allow us to do things a little easier. Again, the full embargo and the, the, the sanctions were in place, but um, we, it, it allowed us to slowly um, be, you know, or, or, or 
give, gave us more legitimacy to keep the two communities in the US and in Cuba together working on those crucial issues that were of interest for both countries. Again, call it national security interest, but anything that is really vital to maintain the communication on. And, and this is the other, this was not a headline. I had to rescue it from the text. That's why I said the, the Iran deal was the headline that I was pleased to see. Oh, the New York Times is, has a science diplomacy headline. This was a, a, a quote in, in the, this is uh, Hurricane Sandy <coughs> in Cuba, and it says, every hurricane that hits Cuba, um, the hur a hurricane that hits Cuba doesn't uh, ask for a visa before entering the US. And I think that quote really captures the philosophy of science diplomacy. Uh, there are certain things that you should allow um, um, the knowledge and the, the communication to flow because if not, it is really detrimental to both countries. Of course, this is very, very um, delicate and we've had a lot of criticism and I will say it because it's true. We had people say, oh, but what about human rights and what, what about freedom of expression and what about freedom of movement and what about freedom of all of the freedoms that are not present in Cuba, right? Does that mean you're endorsing this regime? Does that mean you're helping that regime? Well, you can, you can see it that way. I don't see it that way. I see it as a, an investment in this continued relationship between the scientific communities um, in, in, in the two countries because honestly, the hard power options haven't worked. And you know, if you say, oh, well, look how great the, uh, you know, these other attempts uh, to, 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 you know, overthrow whatever regime in this country. Look how successful, we should keep doing that. Well, the reason it hasn't worked, that's why we have to try another approach and, and, and maybe a diplomatic approach and a science diplomatic approach could, could be one of the, of the paths. Um, it is also um, an important issue in terms of uh, access to, to life-saving medicine. So, very few people know that Cuba has a very robust and very excellent biotech and drug discovery, drug development um, enterprise. Um, and, and, and there are some vaccines and, and cancer drugs that because of the sanctions and the embargo are not available in, in the US. So people illegally, American people have been found going to Cuba for treatment illegally because they are not uh, allowed to, 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 to travel to the country, but they would risk it because they, they think that they need the, that, that um, particular medicine. Um, and so that also made headlines in the New York Times, uh, you know, smuggling cancer vaccines. And, and, and you know, when you think about it, why we shouldn't collaborate in things that are mutually beneficial like curing cancer. So we've done a lot of work in these three areas that I mentioned that are crucial for both the US and Cuba, and those are uh, infectious disease, cancer, and also we've done work in neuroscience. Because one of the things about Cuba is that because it's been isolated, they don't have technology. They cannot, because again, the sanctions, they cannot buy equipment. You cannot just order like a MRI scan. And because you can't buy anything, you have to make it. And so they have been very good in terms of entrepreneurship and creativity, so they build their own uh, devices for neuroscience and, and, and CT scans and all sorts of instruments that it's incredible how you could, almost with nothing, build such a sophisticated instrument. And they have also managed to make high-tech healthcare available for free and, and, and to, the, to the population. So, so everything that they've developed goes into the public health um, you know, system. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting model called the, called the closed loop from lab to clinical to public health. Um, and, and, and this is another model that many countries and, and many places in the US are trying to model, especially places that are very, the, the cost of healthcare is very, very high. So there are things to learn from each other. There are things to, uh, you really have to approach any science diplomacy collaboration uh, from a very, uh, equal and horizontal partnership, so you're not going to teach anyone anything, or you're not going to extract, uh, you know, oh, they have this great drug, let's take it and, and then, you know, run it by the FDA, and then, you know, Genentech or Novartis will, will own it. Um, so it's really a, an 
it ideally, it's not always easy, of course. It has to be an equal partnership, and you have to treat each other as equal. And, and with maybe different assets, but everybody has something to bring to the table. Um, so I'm running really late, and I'm only in the first part. So I'm going to jump to what uh, I think brings me here is really how do we um, insert this thinking, this training, this exposure uh, to science diplomacy? Uh, how do we get our students and our scientists ready? And also our diplomats, so really everyone. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm mostly focused on the next generation because I, I just have the hope that, uh, you know, I think it's really hard to take. I mean, maybe the ambassador in the room is an exception because we, we were just talking about how, you know, um, you published a paper in a scientific journal, things that you wouldn't think in, in your, you know, career that you would do. But it's harder to get people that are very established and very senior to change their ways. But having, you know, people at college and grad school level, um, they, you, can, you can insert those elements into their training much easier than an established um, career path. So there are many entry points to science diplomacy and there are many um, institutions that you can um, approach it from. And, and I call it science diplomacy ecosystem because it is really a combination of um, government, non-government, uh, NGOs, universities, foundations, private sector, and, and this ecosystem, um, you know, the, the more I think diverse and rich, the better science diplomacy ecosystem you have. And many, so the US is the, the country with the most, I would say, developed science diplomacy ecosystem and diversity of institutions, and most countries don't even have half of this. So it's really hard to go into science diplomacy without the, the, the basic pillars and, 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 and elements that, that, that make it up. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of how you can, as a country, but also as an individual, if you want to go in science diplomacy, how, how can you start? Well, so you can, you can use uh, traditional instruments like uh, science uh, agreements. I was talking about how countries come together from conflict and sign uh, scientific agreements, those are classic science and technology bilateral agreements, and pretty much the U.S. Has, has won pretty much with any country in the world. And so you can move people, you can exchange people, and that is what the universities do. This is a public diplomacy type of science diplomacy because by, by getting people together, by uh, promoting joint research and travel and mobility, you are um, improving the relationship and the trust between the peoples of the two countries. Um, you can create joint institutions. For instance, in, there is a water institute in, 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 uh, in Israel that sits you know, between Israel and Palestine. The water institute is uh, co-directed by an Israeli and a Palestinian scientist. So the two countries agree to have this joint uh, institute for cooperation in water research. And, of course, there are many issues that they do not agree on, they do not cooperate, they don't talk, but they agree to do, at least for that water research part, they agree to work together and, and, and co-found these, these joint institutions. Then uh, the infiltration piece. So we talk about infiltrating the government, meaning inserting scientists in the government. And <coughs> I'll talk about, about it in a minute because Melody is one of those infiltrates was one of those infiltrates. Uh, still, still, yeah, exactly. You, you, you never, you never stopped. So um, having scientists be, um, you know, inserted, embedded in the government and, and at all levels is one of the ways. So we talk about science advisors and it looks like, oh, this is the high level science advisor or chief scientist like John Holdren was. Uh, we don't have one now, so. President Trump does not have a science advisor. But usually, uh, and for the past, I don't know how many years or decades, uh, so OSTP has been providing science advice to the president, and many countries are uh, appointing not just science advisors to the prime ministers, but also science advisors to the foreign ministers. And that's how you get the science diplomacy, meaning you get the scientific advice into your foreign policy. 
Uh, you can also have scientists in your embassies. So you have science attaches, science counselors, and all these different positions that are posted in another country and they help you connect the scientific communities in the country of origin and the country of destination. Um, the US has this really great program called, called Embassy Science Fellow. So you can go to a uh, US embassy for three months, I think, um, and any, anywhere in the world, and, and the State Department runs it. And it's a, it's a great way to, to just you know, have a, a, a three-month summer placement in, in a US embassy and help them deal with any scientific issues, uh, the scientific issues of the day or of the region. Also, USAID has a very big and very strong um, network of science uh, missions and, and science advisors. And um, I'm going to talk about the fellows and the, the, the mechanisms that get people there in a minute. Um, and then you can, you can incentivize science diplomacy by saying that this is something like the EU, for instance, does, uh, USAID also does, saying, okay, we will open this call for funding, uh, you know, in between the Mediterranean countries. So only you are eligible if you are one of, you know, in one of those countries, and that is intentional to bring together Spain and Italy and France with uh, Morocco and Tunis and the Middle East. So this is a way to, to, to you, you say, we're gonna work on a common problem and only individuals and scientists in that region are allowed to apply. Uh, and so that really promotes uh, not just the, the tackling the scientific problem, but um, also the, 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 the building the relationship between the scientists of these countries that not necessarily have uh, good diplomatic um, relations. So. In, when we talk about infiltrating the government, we mean <laughs> that uh, the, the, I would say the model pro program that, that um, has been doing that is our program at AAAS uh, called Science and Technology Policy Fellowships. Melody is one of them. What year were you? Uh, 1999-2000. And posted where? Center for the Rankin Software. So um, Melody was a congressional fellow that, so we have fellows uh, in the three branches of government. So these are PhD scientists or engineers um, that we take them out of the lab or academia, wherever they are, and we send them to uh, Washington for a year or two. And they can work in any of the, the executive uh, agencies. So they work in the State Department, they work at USAID, they work at DOE, they work at NASA, NSF, NIH, you name it. Um, and then we have the congressional fellows that are mostly sponsored by scientific societies but also administered jointly with AAAS, and they are placed in, 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 um, in senators' office and, and uh, members of Congress, and they help with legislation that has scientific dimensions, which increasingly anything that, that uh, uh, goes through a, 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 you know, a, a legislative office, um, it has some sort of scientific dimension. So the, uh, this, this person will really need technical stuff to, to help him or her uh, understand it and then decide what the position um, is. And then we are now starting the judicial branch. We have two fellows in the judicial branch uh, because, of course, there is uh, much to, um, to, to um, take from science, from uh, forensics, to, to you name it, any, uh, especially technology related. And so if you want to learn more, there's tons of information about this, and uh, as I say, you can only access that program uh, after your PhD, and you have to be a US citizen, so that's the uh, caveat. I know there are some international, many international students and, and, and researchers that are interested, but because of security clearance, you cannot um, um, access this program if you're not a US citizen, but uh, it really, I really recommend it because it changes the culture of the office you hosted um, at, and also it changes your, it, it really shapes your understanding of the policy process, and as a scientist, you understand what are the points and what are the, 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 the approaches that um, you, uh, and the, the effective approaches for a scientist to inform or, or influence um, policy. But, of course, some, we're seeing a trend. More and more people want to engage in the science policy interface, science diplomacy, before they finish there. So if someone is doing a PhD or even undergrad uh, and they have an interest uh, 
uh, of sort of stepping out of their you know, chemistry um, major and, 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 and taking interest in these policy and diplomacy issues. How do we um, insert that early on uh, before they've completed or during their education? So um, one of the, 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 the most effective ways, of course, is so we run workshops and, and, and training programs that put people in simulated scenarios. So if you can't do the real thing, you can at least pretend that you are in the real thing and you give, you know, we give students characters and we, we force them to get into a place, into the unfamiliar place. So if you were a scientist, uh, sometimes you get the role of a diplomat and you have to, you know, play that character. You understand how different the thinking and the decision making is. Uh, on the same issue from the scientific perspective and the diplomatic perspective. And, and by, by doing these role play um, exercises, um, they can very fast understand, oh, these are all the competing interests, and I thought the science could dictate, you know, these are the other decision, but now I realize that there's this political and, and um, you know, social or economic or religious or, you know, the values, everything else that plays into a decision making, making a uh, decision maker, making a decision uh, or, 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 or passing uh, legislation. So, um, and that, so that's one of the reasons I'm here because uh, Melody and, 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 and the Vicky Center have been really pioneered in this uh, uh, experiential learning for science diplomacy, uh, this experiential learning approaches uh, for science diplomacy and with the, with the Model RT Council. And, and, and uh, right now we're trying to develop more of those scenarios and more uh, in, in all these different topics because uh, you can have uh, you know a simulation of pretty much anything of a nuclear agreement or uh, you know a, a, a health related um, WHO type of um, scenario it really the possibilities are, are, are endless and if you've done model UN and, and any of these exercises you you will be familiar so um, we run workshops in DC uh, but also in, 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 in other countries. Um, we have a big partnership with the World Academy of Sciences, which is in, in, in Trieste, Italy, and we run workshops in science diplomacy for developing, uh, developing countries, well, the global south. And uh, we are now starting our regional workshops, so we're gonna focus the issues on a particular region, so we're doing one in Africa um, next month, starting with South Africa and then rotating um, around different countries. Um, and. Uh, it really is, uh, it, it, it is transformative. The, the students report um, a really, um, you know, a, a good understanding of, in a, in a relatively short time, five days or a week, uh, it's really eye-opening to get this exposure. So more and more, um, uh, we, we were sensing more and more interest uh, for science diplomacy in, particularly at the grad student level, uh, sort of that was our demographic. So we were seeing a lot of students self-organizing uh, and creating science diplomacy clubs and groups because they didn't find uh, the academic home or the sort of faculty sponsor that would, that would help them you know, uh, navigate this space. They say, well, I, will, I would like to get some training in science diplomacy. I can go to Washington and AAAS, but there are no many options. Or I can do a self kind of taught curriculum that I go to a class in international law and the next day I go to a class in um, you know, um, international relations. So they shop around for classes to take that complement their scientific training. And this is how some of these groups that are um, um, shown in the slide started. And, and for instance, uh, it, at, at Penn, um, two grad students decided to create a curriculum uh, for science diplomacy, and they just literally wrote down, okay, you need to take this, you know, uh, class, um, this, you know, set of five courses, and that is what makes a science diplomacy uh, curriculum kind of thing. Fletcher, which is a diplomacy school, didn't have a science diplomacy concentration, and they had environmental diplomacy, they had nuclear, they had energy, they had water, they had all these separate kind of um, issue-specific um, programs, 
And then two grad students, again, decided to create a new concentration and it's like a, a make your own. That's why I like very much the, the make your own internship or design your own experience here because it really, uh, it really shows how creative and entrepreneurial and, and how the, the students today are craving this broader engagement beyond the you know, narrow scientific laboratory work. Um, so here's a, um, a number of uh, institutions that are moving in that direction, including you. And last year we had a, a, a gathering in Boston at the at the Triple S annual meeting, and we decided to create a network. It's it's really it's not a formal membership thing, but it's really trying to bring together all the institutions that are doing science diplomacy education in one way or another, and it's very flexible, it's very broad. Some of them you will recognize, like, you know, Georgetown has been doing this forever, and they, they just didn't call it science diplomacy, they call it science and technology and international affairs. But it is basically, in essence, it's the same thing. So by, by bringing people together, by bringing, uh, sharing the different experiences and approaches, we hope that at some point science diplomacy will be Part, not just this extracurricular or volunteering thing, but it will be a part of both the scientific and, and uh, the international uh, relations um, curricula. So you can visit the website, you can browse, we have a bunch of resources and, 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 and links, but I think the, the one I will highlight is the, we created an online course. So there was no online resource to learn about science diplomacy and we basically recorded ourselves <laughs> talking for an hour, me and my boss, and, and, and enough. It's, it's better produced, it has all these graphics, it's, it, it, it's a professional video, not just like us with a webcam. Um, but it, it really gives uh, an overview of uh, you know, what we call Science Diplomacy 101, and it, it, it touches briefly but on everything, but it's, it's quite, I think it's quite comprehensive, of course, in the limited time available but you can uh, access it, it's one hour, so it's not too bad. Uh, and it's, you know, break from Netflix, you can, you can um, be with us for an hour and then go back to, to Breaking Bad or whatever the more interesting um, thing of the day is. But yeah, so here's the link if you want to, to watch it free. So I will end by um, showing you my, uh, as Melody was saying, I, I recently had the privilege to travel to Antarctica, and it was one of my lifelong dreams, not just because, I mean, every, I think everybody dreams about, about it um, for very good reasons, but especially because of this you know, significance for science diplomacy being one of the birth, you can see one of, one of the birthplace of science diplomacy, and I was privileged to, to be uh, invited by the Chilean government to go to their base in, in King George Island. And, the, what I got, I was only there for a day. It was really like literally in and out. I didn't know you could do that in Antarctica. You can fly in and out literally in a day. And, and it was amazing how all of the theory and all of the reading and everything that I thought I knew about science diplomacy was felt so deeply by being there. And, and, and Melody, who spent many, many months in, in Antarctica can, can say that just by you know, we arrive there, and there's the Chilean base, and then there's the Chinese, and then there's the Russian. And, and your phone goes between, like, welcome to Russia, welcome to China, welcome to Chile, welcome to, you know, it, it just keeps welcoming you because each country has their own, of course, cellular network, but they are literally sitting, you know, next to each other. And then, you know, they, they, they share this church, which is an Orthodox uh, Russian church, but everybody goes because that's the only church. So, you know, everybody's welcome to, to, to use that church. And, and, and then the scientists, so when we arrived, uh, the, we arrived in the Chilean um, research station and there, were, there was empty and, and we asked, so where are all the scientists? Said, oh, they are in Russia because they, they had their 50th anniversary and they are having a big conference. So all the scientists from all the bases around uh, had gone to the Russian uh, base for, for a scientific conference. And it was this natural, uh, you know, this feeling of just sharing everything because you know you're in such a constrained and limited environment and and you're literally your life uh, depends on your colleagues and and the Chileans uh, told us how they are responsible for evacuating anyone that is sick from any country so whoever gets sick the Chileans have to uh, bring them back to to the mainland and 
and, and, and really it doesn't matter who you are and where you're from and whether your country at that moment is friends with, you know, if Chile is friends with Russia at the moment or not, it doesn't matter. So how that spirit of science diplomacy was so tangible by being there and, and see and watching the science uh, being done in real time uh, in that environment. And, and, and you even get a passport stamp with a penguin, which I, did, I thought it was an a, a, a urban legend or a myth, but it's true. And I, I have it there. So um, if you want to learn more, you can watch that video that I show you, but also you can come to Washington. And we have a workshop coming up in June. Uh, and the application is closed, but I could, of course, uh, consider any late applicants if it comes from you. So let me know if you're interested. And, and this is a one-week immersion workshop, so it's it's very in depth. Um, and 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 if you if you if you're interested, let me know, and we can make it happen because uh, we have some flexibility still. It's early, so it's end of June. Yeah, the last week of June. So let me know. So I thank you all for coming, and Melody for inviting me. And anything else, please reach out or tweet. And I'm very, very, I'll be very pleased to, to follow up. And take some journals uh, before they go. I have three. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. I know it might be late for folks, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to go. But if there's a question or two, I'd be happy to take it. John. So thank you for that presentation. It's fascinating. I have uh, actually 11 questions here, so I will <laughs> censor myself. And so uh, one, one comment. Uh, I don't think there was anything more effective in terms of reminding Americans uh, of our national interest in science and technology than the Ebola threat because every American hospital had to develop a protocol mm -hmm. to deal with Ebola, in part because we hadn't dealt with the problem in West Africa. Right. And if you think about the question of cost, you think about the question of uh, uh, the opportunity cost of having to do that, uh, as soon as we decided to go to Guinea and Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire and essentially solved the problem there, we, we, were, we were off the hook. And so I'm a little surprised that we have not used that case more effectively. I'm, you, you talk about the potential with Cuba for challenges and whatever, but this was an actual case mm -hmm. that affected every American. And so I, I, I would just suggest that. My two quick questions are, you did not talk mostly about the use of science a, as a diplomat in the sense that increasingly American diplomats are using GPS systems mm -hmm. to understand dynamics on the ground. They're using cell phone networks. They're using hackathons and data pluses mm -hmm. and crowdsourcing and big data. And I'm intrigued as to whether you believe that that is the future of diplomacy. And if so, is it going to take a generational shift? And then I have to ask the question, we have a president in a White House that is as anti-science as I've ever seen in my lifetime. In not only the question of not having a science advisor, but denying climate change. Mm -hmm. We have a head of the EPA who actually says it's unclear right. whether it's happening, and it may even be a good thing right. that we're having global warming in this case. Right. How does that affect the work that you're trying to do? Does science not become a neutral element, but is it a negative element mm -hmm. when you have a science-denying White House, and I would just remind you, at the center of your chart of the ecosystem right. was the White House. <laughs> and so you've got a cancer at the heart of that system. Right, right. I don't expect you really to come up with an answer to that <laughs> one, but... No, I, I, I think I have some... I mean, of course, I think about that a lot. Thank you for the questions. I think the first one is um, faster to answer. Um, so. When we talk about science diplomacy, we tend to not include technology diplomacy. And I think that 
is a very important dimension that we just keep, we just say science diplomacy and it kind of, we think includes, but it doesn't really, you know, the tech innovation side of things is not always included. So of course, how technology is affecting diplomacy, absolutely crucial. And, and actually countries now are, so Denmark is the first country to appoint an ambassador, not to a country, but to a region, which is Silicon Valley. So Denmark has an ambassador to Silicon Valley. And it's, it's, called, it's called Tech Ambassador. And it's very interesting to, to see the shift and how countries are now not you know, conducting diplomacy in the traditional way, but they now see the hot spot uh, in, in, in technology uh, and us, as uh, Silicon Valley, of course, is. And they decide that their diplomatic focus needs to be uh, you know, specific to that uh, particular tech ecosystem and, and not just, it doesn't, it doesn't um, it's not the same uh, as having a, an ambassador to the US, you also have an ambassador to that particular very uh, um, uh, specific ecosystem of, of technology and innovation. So that's one example, and, and I'm, I'm sure there will be more. Next week there's a conference in the Swiss, are, are, I think, organizing it in San Francisco called Tech Diplomacy, and they are going to bring all the, I, mean, I think this ambassador from Denmark, but a bunch of countries who have this tech focus, in, in California, and they're going to talk about tech diplomacy. So yes, very, very important um, question. And then second, well, how is affecting our work? So it is really, in many ways, when our CEO, our CEO is Rush Holt, who's a former congressman, and he's also a scientist, co uh, congressman uh, for New Jersey. He was 16 years Congress congressman before becoming our CEO. Many places around the world that we go, because there is this vacuum in leadership from the government, in international science engagement, we are seen sometimes as the voice of the scientific community, you know, abroad, because there is just no one, you call the White House, you call OSTP, there is no, no one to pick up the phone, right? So many also countries have lost their counterparts. At State Department, for the, the, the State Department sits on the, um, the bilateral science agreements and, 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 and many other instruments, and you know, if some countries complain that they've lost their counterparts and they don't know who to go to for, you know, information and continuing partnerships. So we get a lot of those requests are sort of kind of redirected from their original, you know, government to government uh, intent that they were intended for. Um, and, and, and I think, so, you know, as I was saying about the Paris Agreement, trying to be positive, I am seeing this reaction from the sub-national, so the governors and cities and mayors, and I, that gives me hope. Of course, it cannot maybe, the sum of all that cannot amount for the federal action, but that is, that, that is I think, a, 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 a ray of hope that the country didn't say, oh, you know, it, it's all lost, but they said we're gonna try to meet those agreements, and you know, things like withdrawal from UNESCO, it's awful, like it, all the withdrawal from the multilateral, engagement and specifically the scientific engagement is, 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 is so detrimental and, and, and hopefully people realize and, and the, the, you know, the American people realize that. Um, and then we, the, the last thing I will say is that AAAS has become much more an advocacy focused organization. Before it was more of a neutral kind of honest broker, work with anyone across the aisle and as long as you know, it was about science. Now, uh, we really, I think, we're turning towards a more advocacy-focused organization, and we call this initiative called the Force for Science. So be very advocate, uh, you know, be, be very strong advocate, vocal for science in your community, and we give toolkits how to run a town hall, or, you know, the, the toolkit to call your uh, representatives and ask them to not, you know, defund certain things and, and, and really, uh, you know, speak to the community about uh, the vaccine, like anti-vax, how to counter anti-vax movements and, 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 and really you know, stop this re-emergence of disease that we thought we had eradicated and now they're coming back because of there is no uh, evidence-based or science-based policy making and that can really have uh, terrible effects. So um, I think um, you know, we are trying to fill some of those gaps in, in, from the non-governmental space, hoping that, you know, it can hold and as soon as possible go back to to normal. So thank you. <laughs>